Uh, and thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. And I'm now very excited to to uh, lead the uh, the final session. It'll be myself and also Duncan McElfresh. So Duncan is a uh, he is currently a postdoc fellow in the health services R and D de uh, department at Stanford, and he also works part time uh, at Abacus here with us. Uh, Duncan. Hey. Uh, nice to meet you, everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce Colin, who is the uh, head of research at Abacus, and he works on um, automated machine learning, auto ML, um, and leads several research projects in this uh, area, which some of which we'll cover today. Yeah, I think the plan is to so the the uh, the I guess the theme of this session is deep learning foundations of trends, and I think the plan is to cover. Uh, first, talk a, a little bit about automated deep learning, and then talk about uh, a sort of a case study and recommender systems, and and how we can use automation and deep learning and recommender systems, and then explainability and other topics as, as there's time. Cool. Cool. Um, so, do we want to start with uh, automated machine learning? Sounds uh, good. Cool. And by the way, if, if folks have questions, leave them in the in the Q and A, and we'll I'll bring them up as we see them. Um, so automated machine learning. I know this is one of Abacus's focus areas, and also Colin, one of your uh, core topics of research. So let's start there. Um, so what is AutoML? Why is it important? Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll take a a step back even and think about machine learning as a whole. So humans have been doing machine learning, of course, for for like since at least the 1950s, we've been doing it concretely and even before then. And uh, of course, machine learning back then in the 1950s looked way different than what it looks like today. I mean, back then it, it took an enormous amount of human effort just to train like a single uh, perceptron, like just a one layer neural network. Uh, whereas nowadays we, we start machine learning by Opening our terminal and and writing import PyTorch and import our favorite pre-trained model. So in the last like 80 years or so, of course, we've come a very long way in automating this entire process. Uh, in in the 1950s, of course, we didn't have Python or TensorFlow or PyTorch or, or any of these tools. Um, and so so throughout this time period, we've seen big breakthroughs in in automation and in, in machine learning. And I think one of the biggest breakthroughs in this whole process of automation was the rise of deep learning itself. So the, the deep learning revolution, which is widely regarded around like 2011, around that time period. And uh, but before, before the rise of deep learning, uh, humans were spending quite a lot of time in manual feature engineering. So for example, take, take like a computer vision, for example, data sets of images. So before, before the rise of deep learning, we, uh, we were like painstakingly like, like designing these features like histogram of oriented gradients, that sort of thing. But, but now with deep learning, this, this sort of all happens automatically where, where we have a neural network that can both learn the best features and then also classify our data in, in one go. And so, so this was like one big uh, leap in automation. And, and so then what happened then? Did, did all the humans say, oh, great, we don't have to spend time with feature engineering, so we can just go home. And, uh, but, but actually, no, that didn't happen. What, what did happen is that humans moved one layer up the uh, one level of, of abstraction up so rather than spending time with feature engineering, we now started to uh, look at these neural networks and say, oh man, like they, they take a lot of time to design and to train. So, so we started to focus our attention on designing neural architectures, uh, hyperparameter tuning and that sort of stuff. And th this allowed us to, to solve much more hard, much harder and more complex machine learning problems that than we were able to before when we were spending most of our time in feature engineering. So, so then uh, 
the next question is where where do we go from here? And I, I think the one of the most obvious answers is we should automate the design of the neural networks themselves and the and the hyperparameter tuning and that sort of thing. So so this is a very active area of research now. We're we're doing this at Abacus and, and uh, we're the research community is, is solving this problem with algorithms for neural architecture search and hyperparameter tuning. And uh, it's an exciting time to be in this area, I think. And uh, one, one more uh, thing I'll add is that I think um, as recently, there's this, uh, this uh, running plot of state of the art on ImageNet over time, where ImageNet is like one of the most popular benchmarks for machine learning. And 2017 was the very first time where the, the world record on ImageNet was an architecture not designed by a human, but, but searched automatically. And, and since then it's sort of traded off between humans and, and, autom and searched, searched models having the, uh, having the record. Uh, but I think in the future, it'll all be uh, the searched models. So it sounds like there's some there's some auto ML methods that you would you would say are just already in common use, like the way that neural nets already do some kind of feature engineering. Are these other like neural architecture search search? Are these kind of other auto ML techniques? Do you think they're going to be part of the standard data scientist or ML engineer toolbox? Or are these they still take a lot of overhead to implement? Definitely. Yeah, it's a good point. There, there already are a lot of great tools for auto ML. Of course, they're getting better and better every day. Um, we we have a lot of great tools at Abacus and and ones we're developing on the research team. Um, and and yeah, I guess uh, there there's a big trade off I think between like how much human human uh, knowledge do we put like like say we want to search over a bunch of architectures. So then we 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 need to decide like how much human knowledge do we inject in versus how how much do we just keep it open so the algorithm can search over whatever it wants to so so of course the the more constrained uh more particularly designed search will be easier but it won't lead to like a groundbreaking new thing we that's unexpected whereas the the if if we just like search over all possible architectures we might find like the next transformer model but but it'll be much more compute power. Um, and, and so so we sort of have tools to help us today uh, that are, yeah, but but as we go, we, we're continuing to design better tools that can lead us to like the, the second idea with with these uh, the, these techniques that can really lead us to big breakthroughs. So so yeah, um, to answer your question, it's sort of like uh, how I was explaining before, like uh, there's been more and more automation over time. So, so we got Python uh, and programming languages, we got TensorFlow, PyTorch, and now we have like uh, auto ML libraries that we can use. Mm -hmm. uh, and so- um, What are your favorite ones? Are there um, anything that you can think of like cool GitHub repos that implement some nice auto ML methods? Um, well, anyone who wants to, Train a model can can use Abacus. The uh, we have a service that, of course, is uh, makes use of a lot of auto ML. There's also um, yeah, there's some some great NAS algorithms here at Abacus. We've developed we we have a research paper uh, that's an algorithm called Bananas. <laughs> it stands for Bayesian optimization with neural architectures for neural architecture search. So this is uh, if if you're if you want to run neural architecture search, this is a powerful algorithm. And uh, yeah, actually we have uh, a few different interesting algorithms on our research page, Abacus AI slash research. I think we, we can like post this in chat later on too. I just posted the bananas paper I found on archive. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I guess, what are your, what are your, you think are the most exciting new directions for research or new ideas in auto ML? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so let me, I can answer this both like on from a research perspective and also from a like more practical perspective. Hmm. 
So from a research perspective, I think the difference between these two is like in research, we, we typically have more like clean data sets to start with. Whereas in practice, it's a lot more like uh, uh, messy data sets and like unclear what the actual problem is, like less, less clean problems. So, so from a research perspective, we're all, everyone in the field is really hoping to have this like huge success story in AutoML where we like discover the next transformer model automatically. And so, so to do that, I think we need more efficient methods because we could like launch a search today, but it would take like uh, years and many GPU hours to, to find like the next, the next uh, big, big algorithm. But, but we're making a lot of progress in this direction. For example, um, the field used to, to like sort of separate the problems of hyperparameter tuning and, and also neural architecture search as two separate areas of research where when we work on neural architecture search, we fix the hyperparameters and mm -hmm. vice versa. But actually, I think to make like a huge breakthrough, we want to actually search both of these together because the next like the next neural network that's not invented yet might look very different, and so might have very different hyperparameters needed to to tune it. Uh, the The only problem is that it's much harder to do this. It's much harder to search both hyperparameters and the architecture is just because like the search space has been uh, huge. So we need a lot more compute power, but we are starting to design uh, techniques that are so efficient that they actually can grapple with this uh, much harder problem. That's it. You made an interesting point. So if you, if you change your, your hyperparameters say slightly, does that also change the best architecture to use and vice versa? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, like larger models need like a, a like st mm. like a less steep learning rate decline, things like that, or or like higher batch size. There, there are all these like small mm. trends between like the type of model and what are the best hyperparameters. But but yeah, I think just by nature, neural architecture search hopefully will lead us to like brand new types of architectures. And so we might have very little intuition on on what the best uh, hyperparameters are to, uh, to especially because these are all sort of like they're they're strange like un uh, unintuitive interactions between all these hyperparameters, and and so we might not know what the best set of hyperparameters are to train like the next generation of neural network models. Cool. Well, let's uh, switch gears, I think, uh, to our second topic, which is uh, recommender systems. This is something that we've both worked on, I think, fairly recently, so we'll probably pitch our recent project. Um, but should we start with maybe, you know, why are rec what, what are recommend recommender systems? Why are they an important application of AI? Yeah, actually, um, so I sort of led the, the automall discussion. Do you, would you mind uh, telling yeah, our sure. viewers the yeah, recommender systems, why we care about them. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, recommender systems are all around us. I mean, if you go onto Amazon or Netflix or something, you're, you're, you're the products that you recommended or the, the websites that you recommended are, are come from recommender systems. Um, and these systems are, are basically designed to, you know, connect people with, with products that are relevant. Like that was the initial um, intention of them. Uh, and they're used everywhere. I mean, they're they're used uh, in a ton of consumer applications. So, you know, they're they're important because they impact they impact tons of consumers and also the vendors. Uh, you know, if you're a vendor on on Etsy or something, you want you want a recommender system to recommend your products to consumers, right? So, a lot of people have a lot of uh, these are high stake systems, basically. Um, so, we care a lot about them. Um, they also have a long history. I mean, recommender systems research has been uh, a, a big area of, of computer science research for decades. Um, and it, it's, it's only getting more and more complicated as these systems, you know, scale to, to global marketplaces like, like Amazon now, or of course, Netflix or, or Google. And, um, also with, you know, more complex algorithms. So now, you know, a lot of traditional Rexus algorithms are, are based on matrix factorization or maybe linear models, um, which are great, uh, but also, uh, uh, the more complex models have been become uh, more popular lately. I think 
now the norm, I think, is uh, deep learning methods and recommender systems. Um, so this is kind of a nascent area of research, but is expanding. Yeah. Um, uh, and just to tie from the previously, we talked about AutoML, and now we're now we're about to talk about recommender systems. Just to tie these two together in sort of a segue. So we, Duncan and I, recently set out to to like explore recommender systems from an AutoML lens. And and I specifically, I had a, a lot of intuition on AutoML approaches. Although, like I would say. At, at least in the research community, the focus has been on computer vision and natural language processing. And uh, actually, we found the intuition between vision and NLP is, is extremely different uh, uh, to, to uh, recommender systems. For example, like vision problems and also NLP problems are, I, I would say they're quite like homogenous in some sense where where like, say we have a really good pre-trained model on ImageNet, uh, it, in a certain sense, the, any, vision problem, any vision problem we might have will need to recognize edges, recognize basic shapes, colors, uh, objects, that sort of thing. And then we can fine tune, once we have a model that can do this, we can fine tune to any new data set or use case we care about. And sort of same thing for NLP too. Like, once we understand language and grammatical structure, then we can do things like answer questions or translate or, or uh, generate new text or summarize uh, all from the same pre-trained models. But, but as we found out, recommender systems are sort of like completely different. There are any, any data set is very heterogeneous. So like the Amazon recommender system has, has users and has session data and the goal is to get people to buy more products, but but then on YouTube, there there's like different users. They're all watching YouTube videos like much more quickly. The goal is to just keep them on the website. So these these are extremely different problems, and I don't think it, it's it's hard or or maybe impossible to to like actually uh, have a pre-trained model that works for both of these systems, given how different the use cases are and the type of data and the and the goals. Um, yeah, the, the range of data sets uh, it, you get in Rexus is just enormous. Um, I mean, as Colin was mentioning, like the, the difference in scale between, say, like you're trying to recommend uh, meals for your local restaurant, right, versus trying to recommend like movies to millions of users. It's just a completely different problem, even though we call these both Rexus or recommendation problems, like they're just entirely different. Um, so that, that's kind of that was a motivation for some of our, our most recent work. Um, where we were kind of doing a meta study of, of recommender system algorithms and trying to understand, you know, what algorithms perform best on what data sets. So that that's the motivation for our most recent project that uh, we've named uh, Rexilla. Um, we can share our, our GitHub repo from this, but um, we basically, you know, tested and trained and evaluated a, all of the the or a, a large number of Rexilla set algorithms that are, that are implemented in the literature, uh, including a lot of the the uh, favorite baseline methods like uh, nearest neighbors based methods and and um, kind of uh, linear model baselines and we tested these on on uh, a large number of data sets just to see you know what uh, how, how well do different algorithms perform on, on different data sets and um, we found like like Colin was saying you know the data sets vary wildly in in recommender systems um, and you know the performance of of a given algorithm changes a lot across data sets as well. Um, so we found that you know not one algorithm dominates in all data sets, uh, and moreover, you know most algorithms that we tested, uh, which includes baselines as well as kind of more complex deep learning models, um, most algorithms usually perform near the top in at least one data set, and usually near the bottom in at least one data set. So not only not only is it you know there's a difference in performance, but there's a big difference in performance. Uh, the ranking completely changes across algorithms. Um, so that was kind of a surprising find. You know, the, the other interesting thing is that there are just like there's a huge variety of data sets in, in recommender systems. There's also a huge number of ways to evaluate recommender systems. Um, I mean, if you uh, when we evaluate systems or recommender systems, we usually look at um, like the top K items that are recommended to any given, given user. Like I might only care about the top 
two items recommended to any user, or the top 10 items or top 50 or something. So you know, varying that that thresh that uh, cutoff, the, the length of that cutoff list changes uh, the order of you know, your best algorithms as well. Um, and that cutoff, you know, that's chosen by your use case. You know, if my if my page, uh, my product page can only list eight products, then my my cutoff that I care about might be eight products. But uh, in some cases, it might be a hundred products. You know, who knows? So just seeing how how different the performance of algorithms across data sets and across metrics was really kind of staggering. Um, but this this opens up a possibility for us to do some cool meta learning. So we can now look at this, all of these results and say, hey, can I predict which algorithm, which Rexis algorithm will do best on a given uh, use case in a given uh, data set? Um, so that was kind of what we set out to do in this project. Yeah, exactly. That's a yeah, that's a great summary. Yeah, so our yeah, we had this this intuition that the data sets are extremely heterogeneous and recommender systems. And there's also this uh, interesting paper that came out in 2018 that that sort of showed that that it was called a worrying analysis of recommender systems. And it showed that many of the deep learning methods proposed for recommender systems are often outperformed by simple baselines like nearest neighbors or matrix factorization. Of course, this was back in 2018. Deep learning has has uh, miles since then in the last four years. But uh, but one thing we noticed also is that it wasn't like, uh, as Duncan already said, it, it wasn't the same baseline that beat all these deep learning models. Mm -hmm. It was a different baselines for the different data sets. And that, yeah, that's what uh, brought us to this intuition that maybe in order to perform auto ML for recommender systems, we should train a meta learning model that can look at meta features of the data sets like, like take some data set, look at how many users it has, how many interactions it has, how many items, look at the distribution of, of items, look at the sparsity. Uh, we, we, can, we have more complex features like entropy and things like that. And then based on all these meta features, then we can recommend an algorithm to, to use for, for this recommender system data set. Yeah, and man, there are so many, so many more questions that were raised from this work. I mean, like Colin, you you mentioned that usually a baseline, there's at least one baseline algorithm that performs really well. I mean, it, it would be I think really useful if we could, you know, kind of guess how difficult a data set is to uh, to, to 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 develop a Rexus algorithm for. Like, which on which data sets does like a a simple linear model do really well on? Like, if we could answer that question really quickly, that would be really valuable. So that's one that's one area of future work I think that we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also um could really explore the the deep learning side even more. So mm -hmm. um so in this project, I mean this was more of a of course we wrote a paper on it that that was it was accepted to the AutoML workshop and it's currently in submission at another conference. But um so so since we had this paper we took all public data sets that we could find uh, and, and put them all in one repository and then tried a lot of data sets. But, uh, but I'll, I'll quickly say at Abacus, we're at a unique position where we see a lot of uh, company data sets, many of which are pr proprietary. So we also have a lot more intuition for designing the best recommender systems uh, at, at Abacus as well. And we, we are studying a lot more deep learning type of approaches here and showing that they they work really well for for many different types of data sets. Yeah, I think uh, what are some of the other I think we're also really interested in ensembling ex exploring that for future work. Um, yeah, we haven't tested ensembles at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's this is something I, I'm really excited to try personally because we we see from uh, from many areas of machine learning that uh, ensembling many different types of models, like ensembling deep, for example, in tabular data, if we ensemble deep learning models with boosted trees, we can sometimes get better performance. And we think, uh, I, th I think uh, any time where there's like substantially different types of models, they each learns some sort of information about the data set. And so if, if we sort of, gather all this information together, like the deep learning model might have learned one thing, 
the trees might have learned something else that that we can get even better uh, performance. And same thing with recommender systems, possibly even more so because there's like item k nearest neighbors, matrix factorization. There's two tower deep learning models. There, there's embedding based deep learning models, and all of these work in extremely different ways. So if we can if we can combine all their performance, then uh, yeah, we could we could make a model perform much better. Yeah, you know, something I've been thinking about since doing this work is since different, uh, depending on how you measure the quality of your recommender system or your recommendations, you know, the, the, the quote unquote best method changes. It makes me really, really want to kind of close the loop between us as researchers and then the end users or the, the the product engineers, the people who are are working directly with, say, customers or users of these systems, to understand like what is important to you, like what's what is the the most effective way to measure the quality of the system, and uh, then you know better better optimize our methods uh, to meet that. Um, that's that's been bugging me lately, so I, I'd like to close that loop. Definitely, yeah, um, yeah. As I mentioned earlier in research to research papers often use like very clean data sets with a with a very well-defined goal that that's very concrete we're in the real world and yeah there are many different objectives that we all have to balance and and uh, like problems with data engineering and data science and that sort of thing but it but it, yeah the most impactful research will bridge this gap I think I see a couple questions in the in the chat and Q&A. Maybe we can turn to that for a second. Sure. Uh, so here's one in the Q&A. Uh, the question says, in deep learning, we need uh, a much less number of models for different segments of user and geo and time. Uh, I think, does this question? Maybe this question is sort of getting at like performance cross time. Uh, if, if I'm under, if I misunderstanding the question, please let me know. But uh, but but yeah, there's quite a lot of um, it, there's quite a lot of automated machine learning techniques that that are multi-objective optimization or constrained optimization. So say we care about like multiple objectives at once. We might we might want to get top accuracy, but we also want low latency so we don't want our model to take like really long time to predict because we need like like a large batch of predictions um so then we can we can we, there are auto ml techniques that'll let us optimize for both of these at the same time or or constrained optimization where we say okay i want my latency below like uh like 10 milliseconds for each prediction and i want to achieve the highest accuracy given this constraint and and we also might have fairness constraints, like uh, like for example, there there are cert in certain areas there are government regulations saying that the model must be this fair, and so we we also might have uh, we also might have uh, constraints there, and then uh, so so yeah, the the I think this is a, a big strength of AutoML that that we have these types of techniques that can juggle all of these uh objectives simultaneously yeah. all right any more questions in the chat uh one one person asks about hyperparameters that are influencing around diversity novelty serendipity mm. uh this is a pretty interesting question so it, the way i think about this question is like, um, I think actually the first thing I thought of is, is like the, the optimization, like X SG stochastic gradient descent versus Adam. There are different optimizers that the community uses quite often. Um, where, where like for any new neural network that we want to train, typically we'll start with the Adam optimizer just because like, this is so tried and true, but but maybe if we're looking for novel architectures that that no one's like 
considered before, maybe there's a completely different optimizer that can train it much better than Adam does. And so that's that's one of the questions I've had for for some time is like maybe the the machine learning community is 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 over overfitting to Adam or overfitting to stochastic gradient descent, where if we often try other optimizers, we might see like more novel or diverse architectures um, uh, and get more diverse predictions and uh, yeah so, something we can explore in the future <clears throat> all right cool should we move on to the third topic sounds good great so all right so i think in the remaining time, we want to talk about another important concept in um, AI and machine learning, which is um, explainable or interpretable models, uh, or ways to explain complex models. Uh, so this sometimes is called XAI. Um, so uh, I guess Colin, either you or I can can start here. But I, I just kind of want to start with the question of you know why why do we need to explain or interpret machine learning models? Oh yeah, there. Yeah, we can both uh, try to answer this. Um, so my answer is uh, of many different reasons why we might want to explain our models. Um, there, there are certain applications where explanations are required, like like for financial applications. Like if if somebody goes to a bank and wants to take out a loan, uh, the bank might use a model and say like, no, you can't have a loan. And then the person says why. So then. Uh, if if we have an explainer set up to our deep learning model, then we can say, oh, it's because you like have this much debt that you didn't pay two years ago, and also like, yeah, maybe uh, worse credit history, and so then they can get back an explanation. Um, explanations can also help in adoption of machine learning. Say like someone wants to start a machine learning machine learning model for some task that's typically been done manually well the explanations will like help help everyone like be more comfortable with this transition to machine learning because we can like see why the model is making certain predictions we, we we also might see that it's like uh doing the right thing but based on sanity checks with the explanations um and uh explanations can also even help with with bias going back to my uh, loan example, uh, sometimes we might accidentally have unwanted bias, like if, if the model makes more mistakes on certain groups, like, for example, if the model puts as, puts as well, in, a, in the extreme case, if, if someone is denied a loan because of like their gender or race, of course, that we definitely don't want to do that. Uh, we, we would normally not even put those as features into our model, of course. But sometimes the model still picks this up based on things like zip code. So, so it's definitely great to have explanations there to, to make sure our model doesn't pick up unwanted biases. Uh, yeah, do you have any more reasons why we might want explanations, Duncan? Yeah, I, I think it sounds you were talking about, I think a lot of like end user, like uh, users or, or people who are affected by uh, machine learning systems. I, I think that's that's probably the most motivating use of explanations. I think another big one, which you also touched on, Colin, is um, you know, for for ML engineers or data scientists who want to try to debug their models or or just simply understand how their models are working. I think explanations can be really useful for for those users as well. Very different explanations, right? Like they have different needs than uh, say the recipient of like a. A, a good or bad loan decision, um, or or uh, like uh, someone who who's you know in a recommender system, you know, getting recommended a certain product, and they want to know why. Like those users are very different from the the data scientists, the ML engineers. Um, so there are very different use cases, but I think both of those kind of fall under the 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 group of folks who need ex explanations. Um, yeah, definitely. So. Um... So what do you think are some of the most exciting ideas in explainable AI right now? Ooh, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's so much there's so much work that is going on that needs to be done. I think 
I mean, personally, what I think is some of the most exciting work is going back to closing the loop between the users of the of the systems and then the algorithms themselves. Um, so by that I mean designing explanations that work for for humans and and designing explanations explicitly that uh, say improve improve um, some engineers' workflow or or uh, modify you know consumers' behavior in a certain way like linking linking the end use case uh to the explanations themselves i think is is really the um the holy grail here like i think if if we can if we can design for for the engineering use case for example if we can design uh explanations that uh like demonstrably decrease the time to debugging or something um i think that would be the goal so so you know closing the loop between between the explanation like the algorithms used to generate explanations and the end users I think that's the most exciting direction. Yeah, definitely. I know the at least on the research side, the the explainability has uh, is sort of notoriously like hard to evaluate. I mean, really, the only the only mm -hmm. way to do a sure thing of it is is to involve humans and and have like user studies or things like that. Even better if we have a particular goal in mind, like help the machine learning engineers debug their models more quickly. And then we, if we can show that our explanations achieve that goal, then, then that's like the gold standard. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one though. I mean, there's a lot of work in this space. I mean, you think of like SHAP and Lime, like those are the, the two most common words in this space. And uh, yeah, they're, they're almost, they're used almost universally, um, but like how and why is not entirely clear. Um, so I think, I think we as like a research community need to need to like do better about defining what's important and how we how we design and measure these things, which of course we try to do in our research, but it's, a, you know, we're, we're, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, yeah, especially with more hand wavy uh, goals, like just help with ML adoption, which is like pretty hard to actually measure. Um, but yeah, if we have some concrete way to measure, then we uh, then we're in a better shape. I know there are even some times where it seems almost circular. Uh, some of these like evaluation techniques, for example, there are some popular uh, ways in the research community to evaluate how well an explanation is doing, like by some metric that we can run. Um, but uh, but uh, sometimes I think the metrics themselves can be seen as just like different ways of explaining the model. So it's almost like we're evaluating the explanation with another explanation, but but we don't know if that explanation is right. Uh, so yeah, definitely including user studies is like a sure sure way to uh, make sure we're doing something right. Yeah. yeah, it's this is one of those subfields that it feels like has been subject to some kind of overhyping a little bit, um, but we're, yeah. I guess this is actually, maybe an important thing to to segue to uh, link this back to to recommender systems um because we we so we were talking about recommender systems earlier um which of course have lots of you know end user consumer applications um that are important so maybe we should we should talk about explanations for recommender systems um is that mm -hmm. do you want to do you want to talk about that call yeah definitely and this this is something that duncan and i both have been looking into recently on a, on a new research project. So um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting trying to explain recommender systems because if, if, we, if we take like a more like a classic machine learning problem like classification, we have clear cut features and then a clear cut uh, prediction. And, and so we explain this classification with the features. But in recommender systems, we, we sort of have like different types of features, like, like uh, we might have user features, item features, user history, like previous interactions, that sort of thing. And so it's not even like immediately clear, like what, like what sorts of, like how, how can we give these explanations? And, uh, and so, so that's one tricky part. Another tricky part is, is like, uh, what's the other tricky part? Every, every recommender system algorithm is very different from one another, as, as we talked about before. For example, item k-nearest neighbor looks at 
the nearest items to that a user is interacted with and then recommends a new item based on that. Whereas user K nearest neighbor has, has like the opposite approach. It looks at similar users who have similar uh, uh, item history to that user and then looks at the, the items those other users have interacted with. So, so these are like two opposite approaches. So the, the ways that we can explain or the, the, the explanations we might give for these two algorithms would look like just completely different. One of them would be based on items. One of them would be based on users. And then there, th then of course, there's deep learning algorithms, which behave in a very different way and matrix factorization, which, which also is just like a completely different method. So th these are some of the challenges we, we found when we first started looking into explaining recommender systems. But, uh, but yeah, we're starting to get some answers. Do, do you, uh, have anything to add with what I've said so far or no, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I just, I can reemphasize all the challenges with developing explanations for, for recommender systems. I mean, I, I think about like the, the explanations I get when I, I go shopping or something on, you know, Safeway online or whatever, and they say, you know, similar customers bought this item, you know, because they look at your items in your cart and they, they run some, some simple, you know, neighbor search or something to, to explain, you know, or to, to say, this is why we're explain we're recommending some items to you. Um, but then, you know, I think about deep learning methods, like Colin, you were mentioning, uh, like two tower models, which are common recommender system models now, and the vast number of features that they take in as input, like, how do you translate you know some abstract feature about my history as a user uh like if that say some like my my say that uh my behavior you know three years ago uh influences why i get a recommendation today like that's that's kind of an abstract like buried piece of data that may be picked up by a deep learning model but it may be kind of awkward or, or not translate well into an explanation for the human end user um so so going between like the the algorithm engineering of how do i design explanations to uh, translating those to, to be useful for the end user, I think is a really challenging, uh, especially for deep learning models. And I don't know if I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know the best way forward there either, but that's, that's a nice research question. <laughs> well, well, yeah, here at Abacus, we are solving some of these challenges and creating explanations for recommender systems. So we, we're working on a general framework for for providing explanations, no matter what the algorithm is, uh, but this is ongoing work. So stay tuned for, uh, yeah, keep refreshing the abacus slash research page for, for new updates in the future. Uh, yeah, so we're almost out of time. It looks like maybe we can check if there are any more questions that have come up. I see one more in the, in the Q and A. How does AutoML handle? multicollinearity and interaction effects between variables like with data in a graph um so my first thought is that i know like when i learned machine learning uh in grad school for the first time uh back in like 2014 we learned about naive bays first and actually we we didn't even have a section on neural networks but but the certain algorithms are very prone to like a uh, collinearity and interaction effects. But I, I actually think deep learning does a much better job at the, like deep learning can sort of handle some like very, uh, very complex interactions among the features in, in data sets. So, so deep learning is actually really good at, at handling this automatically. Um, and the, the second part of the question is data in a graph. So this, uh, this is something I, I don't quite have as much hands-on experience, but but I know there's like a, a large line of work in, in graph neural networks, graph convolutional networks. And so I think there are also specific techniques to handle the very complex interactions of between the variables in a graph too. Mm -hmm. And the, the collinearity and, and interaction effects, I think are also an interesting challenge for ex explanations. Um, because uh, if I say explain one feature that's also dependent on another feature, then am I really giving the whole picture, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, yeah, those are some of the key challenges and why 
I think uh, that that's some of the main intuition for what Shap tries to handle is is the deal with this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, still it's really tricky like uh, to do this in the best way. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions that appeared in chat? Uh, yeah, okay, I don't think so. So, and I, I guess we're out of time now too. So maybe I'll hand it off to Bindu to close out the conference. Yeah, great. Thank you, Colin. That was great. And Duncan, thank you guys so much for that fantastic session. I thought that was a really good informal conversation, especially about some key uh, research areas that we've been focused in, but I, or focused on, but also something which I'm sure applies to enterprise and applied AI as a whole. Uh, thank you again, uh, all of you for coming. Please do keep in mind that we do have monthly workshops. We do give out MLOps certificates there. If you actually do that, complete that workshop end to end, um, they are very well attended. Uh, look out for those uh, messages from us. Um, and also thank Thanks for coming and hope you had a great time. See you next time. Thank you. Bye.